Hello, everyone. This is number 12 in my ongoing series on YouTube called Jesus Archaeology. We're trying to get at the historical figure of Jesus. We look at texts, primarily the New Testament, but some outside, as well as material or archaeological evidence. And taking all of our evidence together, we're trying to shed light on what we can know about Jesus. And in this particular episode, number 12, I want to talk about the last night of Jesus. How did he spend the last evening? Traditionally, the Lord's Supper, the Passover, we're going to dive into that. So I've got slides as usual for this series. It's very visual. Okay, we're continuing our consideration of what I've called the final days of Jesus, the last week of his life. We've already done a program on the Messianic Temple takeover, and then the last one we did was on Herod's Temple and all the activity that final week of Jesus' life, most of which took place inside the temple. And there's a virtual tour that I just put up on YouTube where you can review all of that just in terms of what Herod's Temple was like in the time of Jesus. So in this episode, I want us to look at what I'm calling here a final evening meal, because I don't think it's the Passover. I think it's the night before the Passover, and a rest in Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a garden on the Mount of Olives. Okay, we'll start with Mark. Mark's our earliest account. Now in Mark, when you come to this point, the last evening, the last day of Jesus' life, he says it's the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. And then at the bottom here, you see verse 16, and they prepared the Passover. So the question is, are they eating the Passover at this meal? Because the first day of unleavened bread would be the evening of the Seder at sundown, the Seder when Jews gather even today to celebrate the Passover. It's the evening of the 14th of Nisan, the first month of the Jewish calendar, as it moves into the 15th. So you actually sit down at the meal on the 15th of the lunar month. I know that's a little complex, but hold that thought because we're going to look at some charts and figure it out. Now, it's possible that Mark does not really technically think this is the Passover, and maybe his phrasing here is not so clear. But almost everyone who reads this takes it as a Passover meal. But was it a Passover meal? I mean, I know Christians today keep Passover in a Christian observance, and they talk about Jesus observed the Passover. We don't now think this is the case. John 13.1 makes it clear. Now, remember, John writes after Mark. He knows Mark, I think, most likely, and he wants to make clear, no, this is a evening meal before the Feast of Passover. And all the way through John's account, he emphasizes that the enemies of Jesus, the high priests and so forth, they take Jesus to Pontius Pilate to get him killed that day. Okay, that's early morning after this evening. They won't go into the Gentile area of the Praetorium where the Romans have their seat of government because they want to eat the Passover. So they're going to eat it that evening. So according to this, the night before Passover, when they kill the lambs on the 14th in the afternoon, not on the 15th, it's before the Feast of Passover, Jesus has a meal with them, a supper it's called, evening meal, a final evening meal. And one of the things that he does, besides talk to them a great deal in the Gospel of John, is he lays aside his garments, wraps himself with a towel, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. But for now, we're going to focus on the chronology and then the possible archaeological backdrop for what happens. So that evening then, when the hour came, he sat at table and the apostles with him, and he said, this is Luke, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. Now, you could read that along with John, that it's still before the Passover, and he's looking ahead to the next evening when he'll be dead, and he's saying, I wanted to eat it with you, but you know, 
it looks like I'm not going to eat it. And then he takes a cup. And notice, this is not like the later ceremony in Luke. Luke records two ceremonies. This is a normal Jewish blessing of bread and wine. For I tell you that from now on, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. Meaning we won't have any more evening meals. At any Jewish meal, you take the cup and you take the bread with a certain prayer. That looks like that's what this is. Even in Luke, especially if you go by Luke 22, verse 14. Now, as you read on down in Luke, the other section of Luke, which has different textual traditions, it sounds like the Lord's Supper, as people call it today. He takes bread, he says, this is my body, he takes a cup, he says, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, and so forth. But some of those verses are missing in the Western manuscript of D. So it's possible that was added later to conform to Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 11. And notice what Paul says. He does call Christ the Passover lamb, the Paschal lamb who's been sacrificed. But then when he talks about the Last Supper, he doesn't call it the Passover. He says on the night when he was betrayed. That's how he identifies it. And the word bread here is artos, which is not unleavened bread. It's a loaf of bread that's risen and fluffed up. And so it is possible that even though, if I go back here, this sounds like Mark is putting it on the evening of the Passover. But as you read on in John and even read this section of Luke and Paul, all would be independent sources. It does appear very likely that this is an evening meal before the Passover. So as someone once said, Jesus didn't eat the Passover, according to Paul, he was the Passover. And in fact, on the afternoon of the 14th of Nisan, before the Jews ate the Passover that evening, Jesus was dead. And according to Josephus, the lambs were slain in the afternoon, and Jesus dies in the afternoon. Now that could be a theological thing that John creates. Let's make him die on Passover, but I actually think it fits other sources. For example, we've already seen that. I wanted to eat it, but I won't eat it. That seems to be the night before. But what about this? This is in the Babylonian Talmud. They hung Yeshua the Nazarene on Erev Pesach, which means the eve of Passover. The eve of Passover is the day before Passover, and then Passover that evening. And Gospel of Peter, verse 3, and he delivered him to the people on the day before the unleavened bread, their feast. So Peter has that as well. So it's possible that Mark is just phrasing it in a way that could be confusing, like, let's prepare the Passover, but it's not for that evening. Passover preparation can take longer than just that afternoon. Now, remember what happens. I'm going to go back here because I didn't cover this, what he says in order to get ready, because they're still going to eat the Passover, he says to two of the disciples, go into the city. So they're over on the backside of the Mount of Olives, remember? And they're staying in Bethany. And he says, go into the city, city of Jerusalem, and you're going to see a man carrying a jar of water. So they're down south at the Siloam pool. And we'll talk about that. And this man carrying a jug of water will meet you and he'll, he'll know you, apparently, and you should follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the one who owns the house, the householder, whoever answers the door, basically, the teacher, the rabbi, says, where is my guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? Now, that does sound, again, like Mark thinks they're going to eat the Passover that evening, admittedly. So Mark might just not know that it's the day before. And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there prepare for us. So Mark does have something about this upper room. And we're going to try to figure out where in the city this was, because we do have some archaeological evidence. And the disciples set out and they went into the city and found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. The chronology, and don't worry about the days of the week. I think these are the likely days of the week. But I want you to get the idea of the Jewish month. So on Nisan the 13th, 
would be the Last Supper and the arrest of Gethsemane. This is what we're talking about. Now, he's up all night, remember, praying, and he's arrested in the garden. That's how we're going to end today's episode. And the next day, which I think was a Thursday, on the 14th, and that's when they killed the lambs, he's on the cross at 9 o'clock, 3 p.m. he's dead. And then all of the culture would eat the Passover meal after sunset. Last Supper... Nisan the 13th, the day before Passover, as John says, and then the evening of Passover is the 14th, crucifixion and burial, and that's when the lambs are slain, and then eating the Passover that night. Now, what about this, go into the city, and you'll see a man carrying a jug of water. The areas where you get water are down south. Remember we talked about how the city in the time of Jesus went all the way down to the south into the Hinnom Valley here. And this is the Pool of Siloam. Here's a reconstruction of how it might have looked. And pilgrims are coming to cleanse themselves for ritual purity in this huge pool. And then there's a pathway that's now been uncovered and is going to be open to tourists, I think, later this year, called the Pilgrim's Path where you can walk all the way up to the Temple Mount, what we saw in the last episode. So the pilgrim's path went up along like this, up to the steps, into the Hulda gates, and so forth. And that's how you would go up to the temple. So a man carrying a jug of water. Now, we're going to consider whether the idea of a man rather than a woman carrying it might be significant, because there is a proposal from Bargill Pixner, who's now passed away, very close friend of mine, and he presents the argument that on Mount Zion, right here, the highest point in the city, you can see the elevation here, there is a gate right here called the Essene Gate, and there's an Essene Quarter where the Essenes live because Josephus talks about passing the areas on the west side and coming to the Essene Gate. Now, everybody doesn't agree with Pixner, but it's a proposal, and he would argue then that the Last Supper was eaten on Mount Zion, and that, in fact, is the tradition. Now, here's the article. I'm going to put it in the description where you can get a free copy of this and read it yourself. I helped him write, as you can see, helped him edit it, and he presents the idea of an Essene quarter in Jerusalem. Okay, here's a great picture. We've used it before, talking about the temple steps. So the wall would have continued on down like this, all the way down to the Pool of Siloam, which is now excavated down here where the two roads meet. This has now been excavated, and we found the pool, we think. And then the Pilgrim's Path goes up underground now, like this, pretty straight up to the steps where the Hulda Gates were. This is Mount Zion right here. So you can see the wall would have come around and then up, and the Essene Gate would be right here. So did, was there an Essene community that lived right here? And we're particularly interested in this picture here. I know it's far away, can see the brown soil. That is an empty field up on top of Mount Zion that we're going to look at. And this is the Domitian Abbey. And the traditional room of the Last Supper is right there where I'm moving the cursor right there. Okay, so the disciples come from Bethany over the Mount of Olives down the path here. They see a man carrying a jug of water. They follow him into the city. And does he possibly go up to Mount Zion? That was Pixner's idea. Now, here's another angle. There's that field we want to talk about. Here is, <clears throat> here is the Dormition Abbey. Father Pixner was connected to the Dormition Abbey. This was his base of operation as a priest and a monk. And the Room of the Last Supper is right there. I can tell by the dome there. It's right there. And we'll see close-ups of it. So, obviously, that's not a first-century building. And that's what we're going to investigate. Because Pixter makes an argument, first of all, that this is a special area of Mount Zion that Herod gave to the Essenes because they think the city itself is defiled. Here's another view of Mount Zion. This is looking from the west up the hill. It gives you an idea of how high it is from the ground. And 
the Essene Gate would be down here in the valley. And there, This is one of my favorite pictures. I'm talking to Father Pixner, uh, such a dear man. I was so attached to him like a father figure. And he guided me and helped me a lot. And this is all the way back to 1990, 1991, when I was first going to the Holy Land and beginning to study archaeology. And here he is pointing out the lintel. And here he is pointing out what he believed was the base of the Essene Gate. Again, this is disputed by some scholars. And this is Dr. Jim Strange, now deceased. And he's with me, and we got very interested in this whole idea of the Essene Quarter. Now, here's you'll see this in the article that you'll be able to download and read. You'll get all the explanation. But here's what he imagines as the gate of the Essenes. It would be located right here. Inside, you would have this ritual pool of immersion that he locates right here. And this would be the Essene Quarter, just this little area here, and the Room of the Last Supper would be right somewhere inside this general area, the upper room. Here's what the field looks like, uh, soccer field, football field, tennis courts, and this mikvah right here is ancient. Now, it was cut later by Christians so that it would have steps going down, two rows of steps going down. But look here, see this? Obviously, you don't walk up these steps. These used to go all the way across like a mikvah pool. All the mikvah pools has these big, broad steps, and these have been cut later. So it was a mikvah. It goes back to the Iron Age, we think, and it's up on Mount Zion, and it's clearly a public mikvah. Here's another article by Pixner, also published in Biblical Archaeology Review, but it was earlier in 1990, and this is the article that led me to find Father Pixner, because he believes that the original Church of the Apostles really should be called the Synagogue of the Apostles, the headquarters of the Jesus movement, was found on Mount Zion. And he connects that to the Essene Quarter. So here is a wonderful aerial map of Mount Zion. And you can see the wall of the old city today. And the Room of the Last Supper is located right adjacent to the Dormition Abbey. And here you can see the field again. The Greeks own this property. And Pixner argued that this is, in fact, the Essene Quarter. And the city wall originally would have come down and then gone across like this. This road is much later. Now, as far as the building goes, this is what it looks like today. If you go inside the courtyard, very interesting because on the upper level is what's called the upper room. Now, this is Crusader. It's obviously not the room where Jesus ate the Last Supper. However, the building, here's the upper room, here's the lower room of the household. You can see these stones going up from a destruction period, and then new stones from other periods have been built up in the Crusader period, and also a minaret from the Muslim period. But if you look at this lower course of stones, these appear to be reused Herodian stones. This is outside on the back side of this building. And notice here, going up here, you also have these Herodian style stones and along the bottom. Down below is what Jews call the Tomb of David. So you talk about the irony of a spot in Jerusalem separated by a floor. Christians go here and Jews go here to remember David. Christians go here to remember Jesus, son of David. Let's look more closely at the building. Here's the courtyard area. And this courtyard area inside is, of course, later. But there's a cistern and parts of the building, as you can see here again, this is another picture of the back of it, do have this older course of stones. So there were excavations inside the lower floor area where Jews believe King David is buried. Most scholars don't think it's the right place. And the floor showed Crusader period, Arab floor, Crusader, Byzantine, Roman period. And at the Roman period, which means you're digging the floor of a building that was destroyed, but the floor would stay intact, there was 
Judeo-Christian graffiti. And here's the ledge of the original Roman floor. So we think this was a first century house and that Jesus ate the Last Supper, obviously not like Leonardo pictured it, which looks like a Renaissance feast. But mass is held, the Pope has held mass here before in the upper room. So the idea is that you would be in the space, you understand, of a crusader building, but it's tracing the outlines of the original house the, that became then the church. It's a house church. Now, how could it be preserved? Here we have one of the oldest maps of the Holy Land. It's the mid-5th century. It's in Jordan at a place called Madaba. And here we see a basilica that was built called Hagia Zion Basilica in the 4th century, Theodosius I, 382 CE. And right next to it, the yellow are churches. This is Byzantine Jerusalem. And right next to it, look, is this house rebuilt of the Last Supper. It doesn't have the later Crusader additions, but this would be what it looked like. It was an amazing basilica, and then it would be built to honor where Jesus ate the Last Supper, and where later, when the Christians came back after 70 AD and rebuilt the Church of the Apostles, as Pixner calls it, the Synagogue of the Apostles, it stayed intact. It was later destroyed, this whole basilica, their foundations of it under the Domitian Abbey, you can still find, because this is a huge uh, basilica. And the Crusaders built the Church of St. Mary there, and they kept the foundations of this first century house rebuilt inside the church. And that's why it's preserved today. So the Crusader building that we go into today when we visit the upper room or the lower room is built on the dimensions of a first century house. And this is very possibly the headquarters of the Jesus movement in Jerusalem. So James would have lived here. Mary would have lived out her life here. In fact, the Dormition Abbey is named for Mary Dorme to fall asleep, that Mary fell asleep. And so it's called the Abbey of where Mary fell asleep, Mary died, in other words, in this area. Here's what it actually looks like, and you can really see clearly those stones from the much earlier period, probably Byzantine, but making use of Herodian stones to rebuild. And so the outline of the building of the first century is preserved in this way. So here you see a kind of visual separation between Jews and the tomb of David, a very holy site to Jews, the second holiest site in the city of Jerusalem, other than the Western Wall at the Temple Mount, and Christians, the second holiest site for Christians, the upper room after the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. So if we put it all together, we have Jesus eating the Last Supper, maybe in an Essene quarter, but on Mount Zion in the upper room. Later, the group gathers there, and it becomes the headquarters. When Paul visits James, one would assume that he would visit him at this house. And we read in the book of Acts, when Peter gets out of prison and goes and sees the disciples, he says, go tell James and the brothers, as if the family of Jesus is living in a different place. So they leave, they eat this last supper, and then it says they walk across the Kidron Valley so they would have come probably through the city here and out this gate. Here's the Kidron Valley, and they go to the Mount of Olives. They go across to the Mount of Olives. Now, here's the traditional Gethsemane, right on the road, not quite a hiding place. And remember, the temple authorities want to capture Jesus, so they're looking for him. So we know this is a medieval site, a crusader site for the Garden of Gethsemane. It's okay for tourists. But in terms of what really happened, we don't think that was the real Garden of Gethsemane. Here's what we get in Mark. When they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. He doesn't say the route. And he says, you're all going to fall away. Strike the shepherd. The sheep will be scattered. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. Luke even says, when they came to the place, like it's something they know. And John clarifies that. I think these kind of complement each other. 
when Jesus had spoken these words, that's at that supper before the Passover, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron. So it actually gives you the route where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, remember who's going to betray him, and that's revealed at that last supper, who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So this is a secret garden hiding place of Jesus. And remember, the high priests and the enemies of Jesus paid money to get Judas to tell them where he's going to be that evening. So he's basically somewhere probably up here. Traditional Gethsemane is right here. That's, that's the compound. I'll show you a picture in a minute. So obviously, you're not going to hide there. But somewhere up on the Mount of Olives, and remember, it was forested with olive trees all over. So maybe up in this area, there is a cave up here that's a possibility, kind of a hiding place to meet. Uh, I don't think we have any way of knowing, but it's interesting to see. This is the road you would come down to go into the city. So they came down, saw the man carrying a jug of water, went to Mount Zion, and now they're crossing back over and going back up. And this is what the Garden of Gethsemane looks like today. I first went there in 1962. If you look at my YouTube channel, there's archive footage of me in the Garden of Gethsemane in 1962 with my father and mother and my sister. And it's all fuzzy and home movie uh, quality, but uh, you'll get an idea if you're interested. You can look at that. It's archive footage of my first trip to Jerusalem. So that's where we'll end this particular episode with Jesus being arrested in a Garden of Gethsemane, even if it's not this exact spot, it's certainly a wonderful place to meditate. And some of these trees we think are over a thousand years old in terms of their ancestry. So I'll stop the share. And I want to separate archaeology from text and text from archaeology, but you can see a real overlap here because we've got to talk about Passover and when it was, and was the evening meal of Passover, or was it a meal beforehand, just to get the story straight. But then it makes sense in terms of Jesus that evening, not eating the Passover, but having a final time with his disciples and preparing them for what's ahead, and then them crossing over to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's arrested. And we're going to pick up the story next time. So take care, everybody. Thank you.